because if we had a hard time in utero or had a hard birth or had a hard postpartum or all of the above, it impacts our ability as a little human being to attach well to our parents. Hi, Stephanie. Nice to see you again. So nice to see you, Cerise. How are you? This is the second time that we've spoken, but you just have this very like relaxed vibe. I feel like when I see you, I just automatically like take a deep breath and relax. So that's something that oh, I appreciate so nice. about you. And we barely know each other. And I'm sure you'll. <laughs> the other people will get this positive impression from you as well. Thank but you. You're, you have a very interesting background and you have a book that came out. So I'm so excited for you to tell us about it. But let's start from your background. Sure. So um, I have kind of had a lot of different careers. So I started out as a journalist and then became a teacher and then became a wilderness therapist. And now I'm a free and perinatal psychology psychotherapist and um, coach, parent coach and educator. And so I kind of combined all these things that I love, which is working with people, working with families, um, really doing um, kind of that in-depth exploration and also working with expectant and new parents, which is really my focus now, and their little ones up to about age five, um, and just hoping to help get those families off to the best start that they can get off to in their journey of becoming a family. Um, and part of that is my a lot of my background is in attachment and bonding, and so um, I really want to make sure the the parents are um, well bonded with their child and the child is well attached with the parents. And, um, you know, coming into parenthood can be sort of a bumpy ride for for many people. Um, there are a lot of a lot of new skills to learn and um, a lot of things to kind of understand about child develop development. And so um, that's really my passion is is working with people. And so I work as a psychotherapist doing kind of the deeper therapy work. And then I also coach parents who are not wanting such deep work. They're wanting more like uh, strategies and ways to help their kids. And then um, part of it, as you mentioned, is is the book that I wrote, which is Preparing for Parenthood, 55 Essential Conversations for Couples Becoming Families. And I say couples, but I know some people come into parenthood as single parents. So it's also helpful. There are helpful questions in there that they can kind of ask themselves and talk about and come to conclusions about. But it's really about having these foundational in-depth conversations um, and coming up with strategies of how you want to do family together, how you mm. want to do life together wow. as a family. I love it. I wish I had that before I had my son. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had it before I had my girls too. <laughs> yeah. You have two girls. I have two girls. Yeah. They're um one's a teen and one's a preteen. Um and so we're we're kind of in the next exciting stage of of life together and I'm learning all kinds of new things about being a parent to a teen. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I, I don't even want to imagine puberty and all that, but we'll get there. We'll get to that bridge eventually. Yeah. So, and you mentioned something, uh, you were a wilderness therapist that just stuck out to me. What, what like, could you elaborate on that? It sounds interesting. Sure. So it's really, um, about focusing on, um, the wilderness or nature as, uh, an impactful teacher, right? So, when we go out, say, say we take a group out backpacking, mm -hmm. um, which is a big part of uh, kind of the training around it. Um, nature presents all of these consequences <laughs> for the choices that you make. And they're very clear. Like, so perhaps you have someone who's like, I don't feel like setting up my tent 
I'm too tired. And then it rains that night. So it's a very clear, <laughs> clear experience or, or it's buggy or something, right? Or, you know, I don't feel like cooking food tonight. Well, okay, you'll be hungry, right? So it's, um, and, and it's also, in my experience, nature is incredibly healing. And so it gives us a space of being unplugged, being away from screens, being away from all of our everyday normal worries and cares um, and allows us enough space to kind of think and make new decisions from those places. And hopefully we can carry those back into the world. So um, my work was a little more kind of what we call front country versus back country. So I did a lot of horticultural therapy. I helped schools set up gardens and then we'd go out with the kids and you know, what kind of lessons do you learn about putting a seed into the ground and caring mm. for it and nurturing yeah, it and watching I it grow, that. you know, so, so things that people could access a little bit more easily if they can't get out into the real kind of wilderness areas. Wow. I love that. And there is something I asked because I also find just the act of going camping and being in the wilderness, I find it therapeutic exactly for the reasons that you mentioned. Like it, me and my husband used to do this a lot before we had our son, but we're actually going, <laughs> we're actually going this, we have a holiday now, so we're going to go this weekend. Um, but I, like, it's the part where you're like detached from, you know, all the, the noise of civilization and our phones and something that I love also about cooking and preparing food outdoors and building up your shelter. So yeah, it was kind of, I was just wondering if it was like that and it is kind of what I imagine. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Was it your experience as a mom that brought you to work with pre um, mothers and parents preparing for parenthood? Tell us a little bit about that. Okay. Yeah, so I, I've always worked with children and families, both as mm -hmm. an educator and then as a, I coached swimming for a long time. I was a swimmer, a competitive swimmer for a long time. Oh, and so I coached have and lived many lives. <laughs> I've lived many lives, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, after I became a wilderness therapist, I met my husband in that program and we got married shortly after. And I was, I was, you know, 36 at that point. And I knew I wanted to have kids. He knew he wanted to have kids. And, um, we got married shortly after, and I got pregnant with our first child shortly after that. And I had this understanding that going out into the woods for two weeks at a time or a month at a time, backpacking with an infant um, and a, potentially a group of people probably wasn't going to work particularly well. And and I was so invested in um, the process of becoming a mom and, um, you know, really enjoyed that first pregnancy. The pregnancy itself was easy and I felt good. And um, so I became really kind of fascinated by this whole process. And I've always loved child development. And um, one of my mentors from um, our school was starting a program called somatic attachment work. Yeah, so body, attachment. body attachment stuff. And it was all about really examining our early times, our time in the womb, our experience being born, our early days on the planet when we come out. Um, and I was fascinated and actually my husband was as well. So we both went into this two-year training together and our daughter was born during that first year and then became part of the training with us. So the other people in the training also got to see this process kind of at work, right? Of a baby attaching to the parents and all of that. And um, it was so powerful. And there was a program in Santa Barbara um, the, the school is no, unfortunately no longer around. It was the Santa Barbara Graduate Institute and they had a pre and perinatal psychology PhD program. And I was so excited about this whole thing and becoming a parent and learning so much. And I did the PhD program through them, um, over many years. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and I loved it. And so it, it really does focus on um, the development from even preconception on um, and, you know, what, what we're finding out now um, in terms of brain science and other things to kind of back up 
what we've sort of felt on an intuitive sense for a long time. And so that was always um, really interesting to me. So the work that I do as a pre and perinatal psychologist, psych, I work as a psychotherapist technically, but I'm trained as a psychologist. But that work is, um, you know, it focuses on like, what what happens when we're in utero like um at a certain point in development babies are pretty aware um and they can remember some things that happen and most children up to about age two or three can remember their birth so um we think wow. that you know we don't have a conscious memory but we remember it on a body level and so this was always so fascinating to me of like, how do we, how do we carry that forward? Because if we had a hard time in utero or had a hard birth or had a hard postpartum or all of the above, it impacts our ability as a little human being to attach well to our parents. And it also can um, affect the parent's ability to bond with their child. So um, I help people in that process of um, really exploring what were things like, not only in, if you are, say, a mom, not only in your experience of gestating and birthing then and taking care of this little one, but also in your own experience of being born. So like a lot of that stuff can come up and we know that things get passed on generationally um, from one generation to the next. So now it's it's kind of like mind, mind boggling to it me is. and exciting and um, and so the work I do is, I, I just think it's so fun and fascinating, um, keeps me really passionate about it. I never thought about the concept of us remembering our birth or even being aware of our birth until I did a hypnobirthing class when I was on Portland, but a prenatal hypnobirthing class. And then they talk, they spoke about that, that the, and it makes sense, like maybe some people think it sounds weird, but like we're there, we're living beings and we're creatures. And just like we have experiences from one, two and three that we don't remember. How can people prove that we don't have, you know, we don't have the experiences, emotions and conscious things that we experience in utero. So that was when exactly. I was first uh, introduced to that. And this is such a fascinating topic. Can you share some of your like the most compelling insights you have? Sure, yeah, I, I think um, one of the dangers that we can fall into if you're a, if you're a parent having um, a baby, if you hear this information, you can take it on as like another terrifying thing that you have to, you know, do absolutely mm. right. Yeah. Like, I don't want to I don't want to mess my baby up for life. Yeah. Right. Um, and so my invitation always um, to parents in general is um, to be really gentle, like be really gentle on yourself. Um, know that none of us are perfect. We're all kind of on this wild life journey together and things happen and, and 95 to 99% of everything that happens can be repaired. So the beauty of it is if something doesn't go well or the way that you hoped it would, so say you were really, for example, hoping for a natural birth mm -hmm. and you end up in an emergency C-section. I was just thinking experience. about my, that was me. Oh. If you have that experience, and I felt you don't bad have to after. say, yeah, and you don't have to say, oh, like, especially I think a lot of moms will say, you know, to put it on themselves yeah. right? of like, I did something wrong or, you know, I can never go back and redo that. And the truth is actually all of that can be repaired. You know, there obviously are some things that can't be repaired, but there are very few and far between in terms of um, psychologically, right? Most things can be repaired. So it's like, even just speaking with that baby, or if even if your child is older, like people do this with their adult children of like, wow, like I, I imagine this experience must have been really hard for you. Do you, you know, how do you see these things playing out? And, and people have amazing insights. And so the gentleness and the openness to repair, I think is so critical for, for any parent, any mompreneur, any, you know, like anyone. Um, yeah. And 
And I think it can go a long way to making everyone's lives easier. Wow, that's deep. I, when, when, as soon as you started talking about that, I thought about myself. And I, it sounds so a little bit silly because if a friend told me she felt bad because she had an emergency C-section, I would tell her, why do you feel like you couldn't do anything to avoid it? But I was so hard on myself afterwards. I think it's because, like, first of all, I had a beautiful pregnancy, just like you described. I was so like grateful to be pregnant and I enjoyed the whole pregnancy. I had a healthy pregnancy. I worked out. I ate well. Like, you know, I'm a nutritionist. I was like really on everything and and just things just went wrong. I was in labor for 31 hours and and he didn't like um, he wasn't in the right position. He was like back facing and they said it was I was just too long. And I also my heart rate and the baby like my son's heart rate was so they just took me for emergency section and I was just first of all, I planned a natural birth. So ending up in an emergency room <laughs> was like mm. I would it just it was just a flip. and I kind of felt like, I don't know, I know my mom, like she's, I don't want her to feel bad, but it's just like, she had a nat like she had all of us, we were four siblings and she had all of us naturally without epidural. My sister had all of her kids. Like, it's just something like that. I don't know. I don't want to say like the family took pride in, but it's just like a, a standard. That's just what like we do. And I was the one who, you know, who did it. And I felt like this guilt and a shame and I didn't even, tell like everyone like in my family i'm sure like my some of my aunties now will hear this and they don't even know that i had an emergency c-section so what do you say to women who probably feel like me i don't know if it's something that's common or or not well it it is common people often feel badly that they didn't get to do something the way they wanted to or hoped to um and again the importance that everything can be repaired and to not like we take on so much mom guilt, right? <laughs> Parent guilt in general, but especially mom guilt of, um, I really wanted things to be a certain way and they turned out differently. And so the other piece that I would really offer to people in general, but parents especially, is the best laid plans, <laughs> like they're always going to change, right? So we have to have a lot of flexibility and hopefully, um, again, that gentleness, and once you're a little farther on, a sense of humor, right? Yeah. So it's like- Yeah, now I like oh. released it, but I just remember how I felt back then. Now it's like almost two years later and I kind of feel silly that I felt so, I was so hard on myself. And I literally, I, like, I'm thinking back and I was really ashamed like, that I had a C-section. Mm -hmm. When, and now I think about it, it's so like, I feel now I can look back and laugh at it. I feel like it's, it's like, yeah, it's not that serious. <laughs> yeah. And, and you can talk it over with your child too. So you have a two-year-old yes, at home. Yes, he's going to be two yeah. soon. Yeah. And he can, he's still in that, that window where he can potentially remember his, his period of being in your belly and being born. So it would be really fascinating i think Cerise, to to just check in with him around you know like do you remember when you were in my tummy like do you remember um the experience and kids even that age can share their lived experience and and some won't but a lot will and you can say yeah at the time i felt really badly and now I realize it's just what had to happen. That's the way that you needed to come in the world because it was getting unsafe. And I'm sorry that we didn't get to have the birth that we wanted. Right. Yeah. And and even that can be like so healing. I know you've said that you've healed from it, but even that can be healing on a different level for you and healing for him. Right. Because he might feel like, oh, like I let my mom down because Aww. I didn't come out the way that she wanted. <laughs> right. And then you can, you can say, no, like, this is, this is just what was happening. We, we were in this situation and it had to go this way and it's right. okay. And here we are, we're, we're doing great. It's funny because my husband, he kind of says it jokingly, but maybe like not so jokingly. My son, he like hates when we put like a shirt on him. It's probably because he got stuck and he couldn't come out. So he's still traumatized. And I'm like, no, when you're saying this, I'm going to say maybe there's something to that. 
Yeah. And, and there is something to that and not necessarily traumatized, but he might not like that sensation. Mm. Um, and, and you can help him with that. Right. So it's like, it's a, it's a sweet way to repair, even at that age. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe he decided like, that's not the way I want to come out. Like, <laughs> I'll take the the exit door instead. Yeah, so. <laughs> sometimes I think so because he was such an active baby in utero, and what, even now, like I see, he's so wild and active. I told I told my husband, like you see, that's what I had inside of me because sometimes he didn't believe me when he was like literally kicking me all the time. I would see his feet coming out. <laughs> it would like scare me sometimes. I can't, uh, I like I, so many times I was on Google, like is my baby too active? I can see my baby's feet coming out. Mm. And now that he's out, that's so his personality. He's just like a really active boy. Uh-huh, you know? so yeah, maybe so that's just they, how they he, tell us a lot. Maybe that's how <laughs> he decided to come out. Well, Thank you for sharing that. I'm sure there's some other mom who went through a C-section that's going to listen sure. to this and, and rectify that. But I'm going to do that. I'm taking note of that. And you spoke about attachment. What are some things that we can do to cultivate healthy attachment with our babies? Yeah, great question. So I want to clarify that when I'm talking about attachment, it's attachment theory versus attachment parenting. So there's, mm -hmm. you know, um, they, they do... Um, kind of come together, but attachment is something over the entire lifespan. And attachment parenting is really focused on um, breastfeeding, co-sleeping, and baby wearing and in those early days. And so um, it's a little different. So you can cultivate healthy attachment, most importantly, by doing your own work on yourself. And um, for a lot of us, we haven't maybe kind of looked at our, our past, how we grew up, or maybe even how our parents grew up, um, our relationship with siblings, things like that. Um, and anything that needs to be healed, trying to heal that, right? So doing that deep work on yourself is always number one. It's going to lead to better relationships across the board. For our child, um, so we bond with our child, our child attaches to the parent or caregiver. Um, and for them, it's really about um, staying present, right? And and the more kind of settled and present you are in your own self, the more present you can be for your child. Um, that's kind of a tall order sometimes for people in our hectic, busy world, um, especially if we're juggling a career and other things. Um, but it's really about just like landing back in your body and just, wow. you know, settling before you go to pick up your child or play with your child or even have a conversation with your teenager to make sure that you're really um, grounded and settled. And that's perhaps the most important piece is to be present and be available, right? And the other piece uh, along the availability line is um, to really make time for that child, right? So to really like set aside your phone, don't be like scrolling while your child's talking to you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when they when they come in with a question to put down what you're working on and turn around and look at them um, because all of that shows you know, hey, you're really important. What you have to say is important. I see you, I hear you. Those are the things that build a healthy attachment. Obviously having a very loving um, stance, right? Like being very loving, even, even when it's hard, right? So knowing, understanding child development um, and where your child is and what they can understand and what they can process. So for example, um, a lot of people will seek out um, support from me when they have, say, a two or three year old, and their two or three year old is tantruming or, you know, is in their very kind of willful stage. They're they're building their will structure, right? And a lot of parents take this personally, right? Like, 
how dare my child say no to me? That's what I tell my how, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's what I, I tell my husband. Like I'm like he's a two year old. <laughs> like I think we have. It, plus, we come from like very different cultures, and I don't know maybe because I worked with kids before, so I understand not as much as you, but just a little bit more than him. So sometimes you know kids are kids, and they climb on things and they knock things down, and I'm like, he's yeah. just a two year old. <laughs> yeah. And, right, exactly. Right. And and so really understanding that child development piece is so helpful, I think, for a lot of people. Like a two-year-old's brain is so incredibly different than an adult brain. <laughs> there's there's no comparison, right? Like so the neocortex is not fully, you know, lined up and functioning in the way an adult brain is. Um, so they're living in emotion and impulse and all of these things. And and it shows up again when they become teenagers. Oh, right? so, so, they have so if you comment. have a suit, if you have a super challenging two or three year old, you could potentially be having a super challenging teenager as well <laughs> mm -hmm. um, or a very active child. Right. And so so just knowing those pieces, I think, is is really helpful. And um um, not taking it personally, taking a breath. And I know um, for some people it's like crying or screaming and, and those things are kind of meant to dysregulate you so that you will do something to help support that baby or child. Um, and they can be very triggering for people. So if you need to, to say, I, I need to go spend a couple minutes in the bathroom and I'll be right back. And you go and you help yourself get grounded and present and calm. And then you go back and you're like, okay, I'm here now. They're still screaming. They're still crying, whatever it is. They're still tantruming and you, you stay there and you just, um, what it was described to, uh, described to me in a way that I really like is in middle school, when your child is on the roller coaster of going up and down emotionally, don't get on the roller coaster with them. Be the bolts that hold the roller coaster together. And it's the same thing, no matter what age you're parenting, right? Don't get on the roller coaster with them. Yeah. Be the bolts, right? You're, you're the adult. You need to keep your adult brain online right. and hold that space for them to be whatever age they are and of whatever big emotions or experiences they're having without necessarily like shutting it down right, right. unless they're unless they're hurting you or someone else obviously you um, or themselves um, you want to stop that behavior but those are all pieces that help foster attachment and bonding yeah and everything you say makes so so much sense. And I'm fortunate that a lot of that stuff came, I don't know, I don't know if it was intuitive or just from working with children, but it's so, I, I know that my, my my parents didn't have that. And I think also like people, depending on what culture you come from, it's so, it's vastly different. And I like how now it's becoming a bit more common and mainstream to say it's okay for your children to have big emotions and it's not so much like kids should be, you know, seen and not heard. And and I really appreciate the work that you do and I hope a lot of other moms like, you know, we we learned this to have healthy attachment and give kids space to be kids. Yeah, exactly. And I you know, I love that it's it's transitioned to you from that um, be seen and not heard and make sure that it, when you're seen, you're always on your best behavior and really right. keeping it together. And, and, and I think because people probably didn't have a lot of um, maybe support or there are very high expectations or whatever it was um, that, you know, the, like often I'll hear, well, that worked for me growing up. Like, my parents did this, they had a heavy hand or I got spanked or I got this or that. And I'm like, well, examine that. Like, how do you want to parent? Right. right. Like really think about what makes sense to you in your world and um, in your culture and all of that, right? Like what makes sense and how do you want to do it? And it may not be the same way that your parents did it. It may be different. Right. Yes, and, definitely. and that's okay. 
my yeah. my grandfather still thinks like he it's just he's you know old school when babies cry you shouldn't like because i'm always like you know what i like whenever he cried i would rush over to like you know console mm -hmm. him and be there i don't know i just couldn't you know, couldn't hear him just like no you're not you're gonna spoil the baby and he means it he's such like the softest grandpa now but he really just said it i think that's just what they said back in the day you're gonna spoil your baby if you hold them too much and and I don't, and I did like, of course, I was like <laughs> obsessive when I was pregnant and reading about parenting all around the world. And I know that in a lot of like third world cultures, the the baby barely touches the ground or anything for like two years. So I always like carried him. And I think that really did help. Like, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but he wasn't a colicky baby. He didn't cry a lot. Of course, like if he hurt himself now, he cries. But everyone would say, wow, he's such a quiet baby. And I think because he was on me all the time, that's why he was quiet. Oh, <laughs> because if yeah. I would like leave him down, like you would hear him, believe me. But yeah. yeah. And and to just to clarify for anyone, like you can't spoil a baby. There's no, like milk spoils. You can't <laughs> spoil a baby, right? A baby needs... Um, a lot of attention, a lot, they can't regulate themselves. So like putting your child down and just leaving them screaming and crying, um, they, they can't regulate themselves um, until a certain age. They can't, they don't have that ability. They need, an, they need an adult there who is um, kind and gentle with them. And they're going to most likely feel safest on whoever they're attaching with. So whether it's mom or another parent, um, holding them in close, especially in the early, you know, the first, the fourth trimester, that first three months post-birth. And as long as they'll let you do it afterwards, because some kids are, they just, once they start moving, they right. won't move. Mm -hmm. um, so it's different per child. Um, but that holding is so comforting, right? And so you're setting up, you're helping their nervous system develop in a really healthy, regulated, calm way so that in the future, when they're presented with something that dysregulates them, they get upset or, you know, they're in conflict or something, they can go back to that really safe place quickly. And that's healthy attachment. That's healthy bonding. Um, it's a two-way street, right? So the um, usually the mom who's carrying the baby, she's also um, self-regulating there. So like you co-regulate just like you would with an adult partner. So it's a beautiful thing, I think. And I think it's critical for our development. And I think, you know, um, kind of, focusing on independence versus interdependence um, can be a little dicey, right? Mm -hmm. We want our we want our children to be interdependent. We want them to develop independence, the ability to go out and do their own things. But when they're really little, those early years, I think it's especially critical that they feel safe and attached to their parents or caregivers. And it's funny you mentioned independence. And I remember that I had a friend who was saying like that my, I'm going to make my child like really clingy because um, I was always wearing him and he was always with me and I'm a stay at home mom. And it's so funny that he's so independent. Now the biggest compliment that we get is that he's so independent. Wow. He's everyone says that he's so independent. So he's the opposite. He's not clingy at all. Once he was able exactly. to walk and run on his own, he's like, bye mama. <laughs> And I, exactly. sometimes I feel like oh, I'm, I'm offended. <laughs> exactly. But but the beautiful thing, Cerise, is you, you helped create his healthy, secure attachment, right? And a securely attached child or adult will feel less anxious moving away from their secure base. And you're the, you're the secure base because you helped create that for him. So you'll see a two-year-old who... Um, feels good moving off to explore the world because they know that you have their back. They know you're watching out. They know you care about what's happening to them. 
they'll still look back and be like, are you still there? Okay. I'm yeah, gonna go. I feel like that's true. You know? Like he trusts that mom's going to be there. Cause sometimes I want to like, he's just going to, sometimes I wonder like, how far is he going to go? He, he, yeah, he's just really independent now. He wants to do his own thing, but I feel like, but he will look back. Like, I know she's there. Like, <laughs> exactly. And if a, if a child doesn't have that, so for whatever reason, they didn't develop that, they will be clingy. They'll be clingy or they'll be so independent. You're like, they're not interacting with the parent. So you'll see both of those things, like either a child who is like what we call ambivalent. So they come in and they're, they're scared and they, they try to go out and explore, but they can't trust that you're going to be there for whatever reason, mm -hmm. or a child who has a more avoidant attachment, which is, um, you know, the parents just didn't show up really. And they're like, I got it. I can do it all myself. But when you look at the anxiety levels of either of those children, they're equally high. Mm -hmm. Whereas a secure child will have much lower anxiety, right? So they'll be like, okay, I'm going to go explore. And maybe, oh, there's a snake in the grass. Like, that's scary. I'm going to run back. But I, I know my parent's going to be there, right? And I can get comforted easily. Whereas a child who doesn't have that will have a harder time being comforted. So you created that secure attachment, yeah. which is beautiful. And this made me think about me think sleep training because I remember when, when, when I, while I was pregnant, so there were so many things that I planned and then didn't go as planned. So for example, I planned a natural birth and like I didn't have a natural birth. Okay, breastfeeding, luckily it went smoothly. And as far as sleep training, I don't know why, but when I was researching and things, sleep tra the algorithm was just feeding me sleep training, like how the importance of sleep training and mama sleeping. And, and I decided, okay, when my son comes, I'm going to sleep train him. But then when he arrived, I ended up not only that he's not in his own crib, he's still close sleeping with me. Like it went like the opposite. But it's just like, it, like it, I don't know about there, but in Israel, it's really... I felt that was another thing that I was kind of ashamed of. Like I was, I, it was something that like, I didn't even tell my friends that, I don't know, it's just, it's like taboo here, it's dangerous. But then the more like after I had my baby and then I was listening, I was like, okay, there are some benefits to co-sleeping. First of all, the benefit for me was that I didn't have to, like I was breastfeeding, so I didn't have to get up. Like I really tried for maybe like two or three nights and then that was as long but mm -hmm. but i don't know to me it was fine i felt he, we did it safely can you talk a little bit about sleep training pros cons what, what you would recommend yeah so um i always feel like this is kind of um tender territory to tread into because yeah, i never want to make anyone there too. I, I never want to make yeah. anyone feel bad yeah uh, of course so you know often there's this idea that um, a baby will learn to self-soothe. Exactly. That's alone. what right. I was told before. Right. right. Yeah. Um, when they're very little, like I said before, they can't regulate themselves. So what will happen is a baby will cry and cry and cry and realize that no one's coming and stop crying because they're exhausted, not because they regulate it. So you have this, what happens biologically is their adrenaline and cortisol shoots up and then it tanks and they're exhausted and they fall asleep. So you do get the piece around the baby goes to sleep. Um, but what can get set up is something that's hard in their nervous system. And again, I want to say this with all due respect. I know a lot of people if you have a, a child who really struggles with sleep, and at some point, most of us do, <laughs> um, sometimes for your own sanity, uh, you can't have them right there, right? So for some parents, um, co-sleeping or, you know, sidecar sleeping, as long, you know, as long as it's done safely, you can co-sleep, right? Um, and that's something you definitely want to check out with um, your pediatrician or whoever. Like, I don't want to give advice on how to safely right. co-sleep, but if you have a sidecar or a certain, there's a certain kind of pillows and things like that, 
Yeah, um, that's how that we started, like a kind safely. of a nesting yeah. in the bed, and then after he got older, that yeah. <laughs> exactly as they get bigger, it's not as much of an issue. Anyway. But for little ones, obviously, you have to be super careful. Um, and so that because they can feel you and smell you, um, provides comfort, right? And so you're more likely to have a, a an infant who can actually sleep better, especially if you're nursing them. Mm -hmm. And it, it ends up being easier for a lot of pe people to do it that way, have them right there in a bassinet or however you choose to do that. Um, and so like sleep training, you can, you can help in terms of um, having good awake windows, right? Like, and this is when children get older, not in the first three months, Right. but um, providing awake windows, making sure they're eating enough, getting enough calories, things like that. Those are all great ways to help your child try to sleep better. Um, and I struggle with the idea that there's a one size fits all approach to anything, right? right? And so whether it's nursing, <laughs> like your baby can nurse four times a day or 24 times a day. And it's all within normal limits, right? Your baby can sleep three hours or one hour at a stretch or not sleep for hours on end. It's all within normal limits. Right. So training the child to sleep, um, I think in my perspective, probably happens a little later if you're trying to help support them like let's get you into a routine like every night we you know as our older we have our warm bath and our book and our song and there's a rhythm and a ritual in that that is really helpful for children um, but I think sleep training um, can get a bad rap because people think oh it's the cried out method where you just put your child in the room and don't respond to them um, and again, I know a lot of people have done that. Their children have turned out fine, um, but, but, and it can create um, some challenges for them internally that you may not notice um, that can be healed over time. So I, I never want to put right. it out there as, you know, you've done something horrible to your child. It's exactly. not like that. It's a lot of people do it because they're in survival mode. They're like, I haven't slept in I don't know how long, and I'm worried about myself as a human being and as a parent right now. Like, I can't function, and I have to function. And so finding a method that supports whatever you're dealing with, right? Like, maybe you're a single parent, and you have to get up and go to work for 12 hours, right? right? And you can't not sleep. Right. right. And so sometimes you have to do what you have to do and, um, and know that, um, it's not going to be like life scarring for this little being. And if you can do it differently and give more support, I think that's helpful for children. So that's my kind of way to dance around the sleep training issue like it's yeah. it's hard it's complicated and there's no one right way to do it that's that's something that i like that there's no some people think you have to do something a certain way and basically you're saying everyone should do what works for them and their family and i felt uh, some shame and and for a minute i felt like maybe i'm not doing something right because he doesn't go to sleep if I just leave him there in the, in, in the crib, in the bassinet. And I was also like Googling and Google was telling me by this month, by three months, they should be able to self-regulate. And I'm like, well, he's not. And and then I did some research and I realized, okay, like it's fine if you co-sleep safely and you know what I learned. And I feel like that also turned out beneficial for me because for example, we recently, maybe a few months ago, I just decided, okay, I don't want to, I'm still nursing, but I don't want to nurse during the night anymore because I just, I had enough. And it was so cool how easy it was. I was so afraid. I even told my husband, okay, I decided that I'm going to start night weaning. We might have a difficult night, but, <laughs> but it was so easy. He didn't even, it wasn't even a difficult night. 
I explained to him because now he's also at the age where we can communicate more. I just told him like really clearly, nighttime, like no sisa, like no no milk. Daytime, milk, okay. <laughs> and then he woke up uh -huh. at night, he wanted, and I said, no, in the morning. And then, and then he just turned around. <laughs> and then in the morning he nursed. And I was like blown away how easy it was. I, like I was prepared for like some screaming and... And it wasn't like that. He did ask for like exactly. another time he woke up and he wanted, I asked him, do you want water? And he said, yes. And then we went and got water and we went back to sleep. But that was it. So I'm hoping yeah. when I eventually completely wean, it'll also go that smoothly. Yeah. And what you're highlighting is that every, every child and every relationship is different. And so part of the piece that we know about sleep is sleep is um, at least half that we know is biological mm. so there's you you may have just a naturally good sleeper or you may have a child who really doesn't sleep well like for example um, we have one child who is an easier sleeper our second child was not a very easy sleeper and still has some challenges with sleep mm. and so um i think it it's helpful to understand that it's not always just what you do. It's also sometimes the child's temperament or the child's biological makeup or whatever. And, you know, you may have a child who weans easily at, at night. You may have a child who is really upset about that. Again, all normal. Right. No matter what's happening. Like, I think we had this the sense of like something's really wrong right but but i think it was different. also the timing because if i would have tried that a few months before before he i think mm -hmm. it would have been a, because he was just oh, why did i stop because he was nursing it, i felt like we had a regression where he just wanted to nurse all night again and i wasn't sleeping well i'm like what he start he went from like nursing a couple of times a night where he just attached to the boob like so but i guess i don't know maybe the communication and he's able to understand he said okay mom needs a break <laughs> yeah. i don't know but yeah i know every kid is different i remember my sister she has three children two of them were amazing sleepers and one like even till now she's not the best sleeper so yeah every kid is different yeah and every parent's different in terms of what they can tolerate right, right. yeah that's true too right my husband tells me that he says, "Well, I'm so happy you're the mom," because <laughs> he says if we were, if it was like opposite, he says I don't have as much patience. He said yeah. I wouldn't be nursing, I wouldn't be doing anything. <laughs> yeah, and I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but you said so many interesting things that I wrote down here. You mentioned also um, like somatic attachment. Is that something that we were talking about now? What what is the somatic part? So the, the SOMA, SOMA stands for body, it means mm -hmm. body. So it's um, working with the body, right? So um, for example, when you do work around trauma, we know that trauma lives in the body. So you can do, for example, talk therapy and that can have some helpful benefits. But if you don't address what's happening in your nervous system, chances are your nervous system isn't going to kind of um, integrate and repattern and learn new ways of being. Like, oh, when I hear, for example, uh, a siren going by and my heart starts pounding and, you know, I'm, I'm sweating and I'm stressed out, but the siren has nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your nervous system is having a reaction and you can help support it and heal it and train it to do something else. So that's the somatic work wow. is like our body is giving us information all the time, right? We live in this like incredibly complex, fascinating um, home here in our bodies of like, oh, like I wonder, like getting curious, like I wonder why my back always hurts when I talk to my uncle Jim, or I wonder why I get a headache when this happens or you know i wonder why when i feel scared i feel like i'm not in my body right like getting really curious about what's happening physiologically in your whole system is so helpful and you can end up 
you know, we know that um, sometimes when you're holding on to things that are really hard, they can manifest as illnesses, yes. right? And so the opposite is also true. So if you know that, you can actually heal some of those things before they turn into an illness, Wow. right? So like before something progresses to something very serious, like heart disease or something, you can work with the pieces um, that are within your control. Obviously, there's some some pieces that are not in your control, but um, you can work with those pieces that are to help heal that stuff. And so it's really becoming aware of your body and and honoring the system that you live in. Can you give us a little example? Sure. So um, I end up doing a lot of trauma work. So a lot of people who come to me, for example, have birth trauma. So the birth did not go as they wanted it to. Um, and then they are having like physical reactions to things like, oh, I even see a hospital or I see an ambulance go by with the sirens on and my heart's pounding, right? And I know that that has nothing to do with me. So why am I, why am I doing this? Like it's yeah. impacting me. It's impacting my relationship with my partner or with my child. Uh, I can't sleep. I can't eat well, right? Like those are all signs of like, hey, something's happening right. that needs to be addressed. Your body's like, hello, I need some help. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can't pretend that it's not there, right? We can't like shut it down. Um, most of us can't. Some, I'm guessing some people can just block all of that out, but it ends up coming out sideways anyway, right? <laughs> and so if you go head on and you direct, you directly work with it, you can heal that. So one of the um, tools that I use is EMDR, uh, eye movement desensitization reprocessing. And it's um, it's a way that we get underneath whatever the story is and help um, your brain and nervous system reprocess, integrate whatever trauma happened and essentially um, help it heal and kind of replace it with new thoughts, right? And so what ends up happening with those people who come with say birth trauma is they no longer have a reaction, mm -hmm. right? So instead of reacting, you get to choose how you want to respond, right? And so I like that. it's instead super, of reacting, choosing how you respond. Yeah. yeah. And, and it can be so powerful, right? Of like, oh, like, I can sleep at night. <laughs> oh, I'm not stressed out when I hear a door slam, like I don't jump out of my skin. Or, you know, we can now go to the um, nursing class at the hospital without me having a panic attack, mm. right? Like, I mean, those are like real um, tangible things that we can hold on to that happen for people. And if you're not living with that in your nervous system all the time, your nervous system gets to relax and then you get to be present. You're like, oh, like, yeah, life's just happening and I'm here with my child and some things are hard and some days are amazing and um, and it's just life kind of going on versus being in this hyper aroused um, mm. state where you're, um, you know, you're even if in your mind, you're like, this is ridiculous. Why am I thinking about it? Your nervous system gets hijacked right? right it gets it gets held on and it's stuck in that state of stress and we want to help it relax and so the same is true um, for any any situation right um and sometimes your body's just giving you really more subtle signals right like oh when i think about this issue like my stomach doesn't feel that great but i've never i've never um attach the two together. And so you just get curious about it. Like if your stomach could speak, what would it say? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I don't want, I don't want to go there. I don't want to see my in-laws or whatever, <laughs> whatever the thing is. Um, and then you just work with that. So it's, um, I think the body is a, an amazing organism and such a tool wow. as well. 
I can already think about some examples that I experience now. I'm going to look into that. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure I, everyone I think can so think helpful. of something that, you know, they you get around a certain person or a certain place or something and it triggers something within you mm -hmm. and to be more introspective about that feeling and seeing how you can correct that. Well, that's interesting. I've heard about somatic healing, but I've never taken the time to really um, research what it is exactly. So now you've given me a better understanding, you've given us a better understanding of what it is. Yeah, and I think just my one of my favorite words is curiosity. Just get curious about curious. what's happening without like judgment. Like I shouldn't be feeling this. Right. Just get curious. Like, wow, like what's that about? And and sometimes you'll find out things about yourself that you never expected. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, this has been such a introspective conversation. You make you're making me think about a lot of things, bro. And I have so many questions. I could talk to you for a lot longer, <laughs> but I want I don't have that much more time left, and I want to respect your time. But um before we end, can you give them um, some busy moms out there that have children, maybe they struggle being present, maybe they're, they have some, you know, things that they're dealing with. What are three things that we can do, three actions that we can take to help us be more present, um, help us heal ourselves so that we show up better for ourselves and our families? Great question. So, so number one, I think is self care. Mm. Um, and just having like kind of a non-negotiable self-care practice, whatever that looks like. So if you like to go on walks or you're a swimmer or you meditate or you do yoga or whatever your things are that help you feel more center, centered and grounded, um, that's going to help you in every aspect of your life, right? So really taking that time to take care of yourself. Another thing is... Um, reach out for support, right? Reach out to your friends or your family or um, someone who can help a professional if needed, right? Um, and just really focus on on that network. Like mm -hmm. we, I think, live in pretty isolated pods in many places in the world. And um, it's not, it's not natural right. for us as we're not, we're not isolationist kind of creatures. We need our social support. And especially when you have children, whether they're infants or teenagers, having people that you can reach out to, I think is really critical. Yeah. Um, and then I know I brought this up earlier, but being really gentle on yourself. So you're going to mess up as a parent, right? right? <laughs> yeah. Whether it's like, we can't show up the way I want to for my child, or I can't show up the way that I want at work and show up the way that I want to at, at, with my child. I'm failing at everything, right? Like that's a really common feeling for a lot of people. Um, so have that gentleness of like, I'm doing the best that I can right now. And I might be a little under-resourced and maybe there are some things I could kind of get off my plate so I could be more resourced. Maybe there aren't. And this is just the way your world is. And in that space, just doing the best that you can and being gentle on yourself when you don't do the what, the best that you think that you can, right? So like, oh, I really messed up that interaction with my two-year-old. You know what? It's okay. You're modeling being human. Go back and repair it. Like, hey, sweetie, I'm so sorry. I snapped at you or told you you can play with that toy anymore because I was really mad that you like hit me with it or whatever. Like yeah. I wanted to do it differently and here's how I would do it. Right. And, and children, they want the connection. They want to connect with you and we obviously want to connect with them. And so that repair goes a long way. So being gentle on yourself, being gentle on the times when you, you know, if you're busy at work and you, mess something up at work right it's like don't beat yourself up about it we're all learning we're all trying to do the best that we can and I feel like for the most part we are all are doing the best that we can and when we don't we learn from it yeah. right well I'm glad you actually mentioned that again because that's something that I think a lot of moms need to hear it's, I need to hear that I'm someone who's a bit harsh on myself and 
we can be gentle and we are i, I agree we're as long as you know we're, we're sane and capable we're trying we're doing the best that we can and we, we can't be perfect all the time yeah exactly yeah yeah well, thank you so much. Can you tell us where we can find you and connect with you? Where can we buy your, buy your book and listen to your podcast? Sure. So my podcast is Prepared for Parenthood. And I just started it a short while ago. So I think there are only 10, 10 episodes up. So you could binge listen if you wanted. Awesome. Um, and that's on Spotify, iTunes. So it's also on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel there. Um, my book is on Amazon or uh, bookshop.org if you are anti-Amazon for any reason. Um, so you can find them in, in either place. It's also in a few bookstores, but um, not sure which ones exactly. It's in Barnes and Noble right now. Um, and then in terms of checking out some of my work or if you have questions about potentially wanting to work with me, I'm at preparedforparenthood.com. If you happen to be in Colorado and want to work with me as a uh, as a therapist, that's a different website. That's drdugertherapy.com. Um, and I'm guessing there will be show notes or something. Yes, I'll can, link everything below. In there. So, um, yeah. So I hope to hear from people. I hope, you know, would love to just hear how you liked the podcast and, um, and all that. So. So thank you so much for having me here, Cerise. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to have you. I hope we can talk again. I hope we can have this conversation and uh, continue this conversation in the future. And sure. thank you. Continue the work that you do is so important. Like I mentioned before, I wish I knew of someone like you before I had my first child, but now I am and we plan to have more. So I'm happy that mm -hmm. I have your resources to support me. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in to Maternity Leave. I hope you found value in this episode. Your support means the world. By subscribing, leaving a comment, and sharing this episode with another mom entrepreneur, you'll help it grow and reach more incredible guests who can share their insights and guidance. Until next time, take care, love on your loved ones, and make it happen. You got this. And it's a ticket talking mother for the biggest as a comma and a comma and a comma gotta get it, get it. And it's a ticket talking mother for the biggest as a comma and a comma and a comma gotta get it.